Good afternoon. This is our lecture on HIV for preventive medicine and community health three. Our objectives for this lecture would be the following. HIV is a human immunodeficiency virus which affects only humans weakens the immune system and increases the risk of infection and a virus that attacks the body. While AIDS, on the other hand, is an acquired immune deficiency syndrome which weakens the immune system, makes our body deficient with CD4 plus cells, and it's a syndrome or a group of illnesses that takes place at the same time. So when the immune system becomes weakened by the HIV, the illness eventually progresses to AIDS. Some blood tests, symptoms, or certain infections indicate progression of HIV to AIDS. So there are two strains of HIV, both transmitted through the same routes, and both are associated with similar opportunistic infections. HIV-1 is more common and HIV-2 is found in West Africa, Mozambique, and Angola. HIV-2 is less easily transmitted and less pathogenic, has a shorter duration of infection, and maternal to child transmission is relatively rare with HIV-2. And this has not been reported from so how is HIV transmitted? So it's with direct contact with infected blood, sexual contact, either oral, anal, or vaginal, direct contact with semen, vaginal, and cervical secretions, or mother-to-child transmission during pregnancy, delivery, or breastfeeding. HIV is not transmitted by coughing, sneezing, insect bites, touching, water, kissing. Public baths, handshakes, work or school contact, use of telephones, and sharing of cups, glasses, and utensils. In India, this is data from 2017 from WHO. 2.1 million people live with HIV. Prevalence is at 0.2% with ages 15 to 49 and 88,000 new HIV infections for the year. 69,000 with AIDS-related deaths and 56% are on antiretroviral treatment. Globally, there's 37.9 million people living with AIDS with a mortality of 770,000. This is for the year 2018. There are reported cases around 15,202 and estimated AIDS cases and people living with HIV. Only a small number of people living with AIDS are reported due to stigma and discrimination, which we would discuss later. So what's the impact of HIV? So there is negative economic impact on countries, overstrained healthcare systems, decreased life expectancy, and reversal of child survival gains and increased number or orphans. This is a table regarding estimates of India from 1981-2003 for number of people infected with HIV. This is the maternal and child health profile of India which still shows that just about 35% would deliver in an institution. This is the adult HIV prevalence in India. The red states show that there are 
is a high prevalence of AIDS in these regions. And mode of transmission would primarily be sexual against a few percentage for the other routes of infection. For maternal to child transmission in HIV mothers, majority of children do not get infected even when we do nothing. So the risk globally is 15 to 45 percent. In India, the average is 30 to 37. This is a graph showing proportion of respondents that state that HIV can be transmitted through sexual contact on selected states in India. It just goes to show that urban males and or males in general are generally more knowledgeable regarding HIV. Diagnosis would basically depend on viral infection and immune response. So over a period of time, HIV infects and kills white blood cells called CD4 lymphocytes or T cells leaving the body unable to fight off certain kinds of infections. Both T and B cells are types of white blood cells called lymphocytes. So how do we prevent HIV transmission? Strategies would include personal and public health strategies. Safe practices, no risk of HIV transmission, and risk reduction, which reduces but does not eliminate risk of transmission. So public health strategies to prevent HIV transmission would include screening all blood and blood products, following universal precautions, safe sex education, identify and treat sexually transmitted illnesses, provide referrals for treatment of drug dependence, apply the comprehensive approach to prevent vertical transmission of HIV. So evolution of antibodies of AIDS would be like this. It has various stages from primary infection for the acute phase to asymptomatic phase for chronic phase and late stage for AIDS. The first weeks after primary infection, seroconversion occurs and is associated with a rapid increase in circulating viral titers and a significant drop in the number of CD4 plus cells. There's a window period, time from initial infection with HIV until antibodies are detected by a single test. So this represents the stage when you have been infected with HIV, but your body hasn't created antibodies. Seroconversion is a term used to describe the changes when antibodies are produced and the blood is tested positive. May test false negative for HIV antibodies during this time period. So it can still pass the virus to others during this period even if you haven't undergone zero conversion. So this is the natural history of HIV infection. There's an acute phase, so more than half of HIV infected individuals experience flu-like symptoms. During the stage of infection, often called seroconversion illness. Then your immune system works to remove the virus from the blood and reduce viral load for a period of time. But replication is constant. So what happens, your viral load would eventually increase as diseases progresses. And opportunistic infections will occur as your CD4 T plus cells start to drop. So virus can be transmitted during each stage. First at zero conversion, when you're infected with HIV, but antibodies are just starting to develop. Asymptomatic, 
no signs but you are still infectious. Symptomatic, there are physical signs of HIV infection, some immunosuppression, and when you have full-blown AIDS and have opportunistic infections and have its end-stage disease. So for immune suppression, HIV would attack WBCs called CD4 cells that protect our body from illness. Over time, the body's ability to fight common infections would be lost and opportunistic infections could occur. Progression of disease is measured by CD4 plus count, so it would tell us the degree of immune suppression. A lower CD4 plus count means decreasing immunity. Viral load is the amount of virus in the blood, and a higher viral load means more immune suppression. So severity of illness is determined by amount of virus in the body and the degree of immune suppression. The higher the viral load, the sooner immune suppression occurs. So a high viral load and a low CD4 plus count would increase your clinical symptoms such as pneumonia and other opportunistic infections to add to the complications of HIV AIDS. Direct infection of organ systems could also occur. This is usually found in brain, HIV dementia, gut, shown by wasting, and heart, in summary, HIV multiplies inside the CD4 plus cells and eventually destroys them. As it decreases, viral load increases and immune defenses are weakened. So HIV eventually becomes vulnerable to opportunistic infections. It's a chronic viral infection with no known cure and without antiretroviral treatment, HIV progresses to symptomatic disease and AIDS. So HIV is a global pandemic and the number of people living with HIV continues to increase worldwide. HIV epidemic is especially severe in resource constrained settings and it's a virus that destroys the immune system leading to opportunistic infections. Progression from HIV to end stage varies from person to person and may take more than 10 years. Most common route is heterosexual transmission. Women of childbearing age are at particular risk for acquiring HIV. HIV positive women are at risk for passing HIV to their newborn and risk of HIV transmission from mother to child can be greatly reduced through effective programs. But then there's another pandemic. It is stigma and discrimination against people who have HIV or AIDS. Stigma as the shame or the grace attached to something regarded as socially unacceptable. Sociologists have taken this a bit further in a seminal study on stigma. In 1963, stigma was defined as an attribute that is seen as a deeply discrediting to a person or group. Those attributes could be an illness, physical deformity, aberrant behavior, or social group based upon religion or ethnicity. Stigma lets people or groups see differences or others in a negative light while confirming their own sense of normalcy and decency. Stigma and discrimination is different. Stigma refers to unfavorable attitudes and beliefs directed towards someone or something. Discrimination is the treatment of an individual or group with partiality or prejudice. Stigma is the attitude. Discrimination is the behavior. 
So, for HIV and AIDS, root causes of stigma would stem from knowledge or lack of it. The role of values, norms, and moral judgment. The stigma is exacerbated by the seriousness of the illness, its mysterious nature, and its association with behaviors that are either illegal or socially sensitive. Examples, sexual promiscuity, prostitution, and drug use. Also relevant is the perception that HIV infection is the product of personal choice. That one chooses to engage in bad behaviors that put one at risk and so it is one's own fault its HIV infection ensues. Stigma could be manifested in different forms. Social stigma could affect your reputation if you are an HIV carrier. Physical stigma, you may be isolated, shunned, abandoned, and separate living space, different eating utensils, etc. Verbal stigma, you may be at the back end of receiving verbal abuse. And institutional stigma, you may be banned from certain jobs or scholarships, denial of health services, police harassment, etc. And HIV-related stigma is increasingly recognized as the single greatest challenge to slowing the spread of HIV and AIDS. It's a threefold epidemic, HIV, AIDS, and the stigma, discrimination, and denial related to the disease. Why is it such an important thing to decrease stigma? Aside from it's a freedom from discrimination is a fundamental human right. Effects of stigma would be a social isolation, limited rights and reduced access to the services, stemming to a delay in diagnosis. HIV AIDS related stigma fuels new HIV infections and secondary stigma is stigma by association if you are either closely related to an HIV or AIDS patient. In service delivery, it discourages access to important services, prevents access to counseling, testing, and mother-to-child transmission services, discourages disclosure of HIV test results, discourages acceptance of mother-to-child transmission interventions, inhibits use of safe infant feeding practices, and would confer secondary stigmatization to the child. And we address stigma with the help of the following at all levels. National, community, mother-to-child transmission facility, and the individual person. We need to support and have our legislation in support of our human rights, efforts to scale up antiretroviral treatment, increase funding for um, services, and share mother-to-child transmission success stories. In the community, we have to promote HIV awareness and knowledge, mother-to-child transmission activities, as integral to healthcare and HIV AIDS prevention and treatment, referrals to mother to child transmission services, and awareness of these interventions. Support we have partnerships with various schools and social organizations, people living with HIV initiatives, networking with linkages, and chaining for different levels. For program level interventions, you must integrate it into antenatal services, encourage partner involvement, and enlist partner and family support to decrease HIV transmission. How do we address the stigma? Continuous education and training of healthcare providers in HIV transmission, 
activities to address stigma, awareness of language that describes people living with HIV and AIDS, maternal to child transmission related policies, and counseling of safer infant. So we have to develop policies that are non-discriminatory, ensures patient confidentiality, that follow universal precautions, and no post-exposure prophylaxis. So in summary, stigmatization reflects an attitude, discrimination is an act of behavior, stigma and discrimination are often linked to violations of human rights. And these are rights to be free from discrimination, especially regarding to HIV and AIDS. Such that key services may be accessed, testing, mother-to-child transmission services, antenatal care, and antiretroviral prophylaxis. This would discourage disclosure of HIV status, acceptance of safer infant feeding practices, and access to education, counseling, and treatment. Maternal to child transmission programs and staff can help reduce stigma and discrimination in the healthcare setting, in the community, and at the national level. So it would eventually serve as role models. We have to involve people living with HIV and AIDS so we can promote partner participation and community support and stop HIV at the community level. Thank you. Please do subscribe to my channel for further lectures for preventive medicine and community health.